guest Dan Cohen, cinematographer and editor of the film Killing Guest. Dan Cohen, a warm welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Dan, what pushed you to produce that film? Well, originally, actually, we didn't have the idea to make it a documentary. When I first entered the Gaza Strip, along with uh, my co-producer, Max Blumenthal, during a five-day ceasefire in the war on Gaza in 2014, we were simply going for journalistic reasons, and I began uh, filming um, with my camera, my simple camera and, and microphone, um, the testimonies of people who had survived uh, an incredible onslaught of Israeli violence um, from F-16s, from the air, from tanks, and their entire neighborhoods were wiped out. And so we came during a ceasefire and people were telling us these devastating testimonies and it became clear to us very quickly that we had the basis for what should be a documentary. And so I continued to go back for months and months over the next two years. I spent six and a half months in the Gaza Strip after the ceasefire documenting what life was. The film and the editing, how long it took you to produce it? The entire process was about three years. We were working on an extremely tight budget. We didn't have any major funders, just from the public, a crowdfunding campaign, and with very limited uh, equipment, and we made it happen in that period. And it was released on? Uh, we released it to coincide with Nakba Day, uh, which, which is, is when... when which is May, uh, May 15th, I believe, when Palestinians um, commemorate their ethnic cleansing, which happened in 1948 under uh, Israel's so-called War of Independence, under this guise of war when 750,000 Palestinians were ethnically cleansed in order to create an artificial demographic majority. And so on March 30th of this year, Palestinians began, began demonstrating and going to the borders uh, of Gaza um, and in what's called the Great March of Return. And so tens of thousands of Palestinians, mostly young people, going to the borders to assert their rights uh, as refugees. And we knew basically there were, every Friday there were massacres by Israeli forces on these unarmed demonstrators. And we knew Nakba Day would be the biggest one. And so we were considering trying to find a distributor and have a big release. But we decided, you know, in solidarity with these marches, Uh, and these demonstrators to release it on Nakba Day. So where it could be seen? You can see it, the film on killinggaza.com. Very easy to find. We will have, we currently have an English language version out and in the next weeks we'll have Spanish language as well as Portuguese, French, Arabic. Your co-producer, as you mentioned, Max Blumenthal has said, and I quote his words, he said regarding the film, we are throwing back the reality of Gaza into the American information space in order to show the hell their government is creating because ultimately here in Washington, that's where the sausage is made, you said. We are responsible for this because of our backing of all this without us, this hell would be impossible. That's exactly right. I mean, we are subject in this country to the most intense propaganda campaign to take what is essentially a massive prison for children. Most of the population of Gaza is children. And so to take this and demonize it as this hotbed of terrorism uh, is what has to be done in order to convince Americans that this is some kind of moral thing to do, to back Israel completely in this, these, uh, this massive violence that's being waged. And so what we sought to do is show who the victims are, turn the camera on them. We didn't put ourselves in the movie intentionally. And just to show Palestinians how they are living and suffering and also resisting in various ways under the boot of Israel with complete backing from U.S. Uh, government and not only you know, the current Trump administration, but this was during the Obama administration and every administration going back from that for years and years. And in other words that uh, you mentioned, say, we put faces of people who appear only on Western media behind masks on one of the most dehumanized population in the world. Exactly. I mean, you know, one section we filmed was with actually with fighters. Um, and, you know, in this country, they'll be called terrorists and they just want to kill Jews and this sort of thing. But, you know, if, I mean, I'm Jewish myself and I was able to sit down with these uh, young men and, and ask them, you know, what is it that what makes you decide to take up arms? And across the board, they just say, we want to we want to end the occupation. We want to liberate our land. We want freedom. 
And I think you know that's something that everyone can understand. You are saying that this is not a documentary, this is a document. Why? Well, it's both. I mean, when we say it's a document, we're talking about we documented war crimes, clear evidence of war crimes, whether it's Palestinians being used by Israeli soldiers as human shields. There's ample uh, testimony of this where you know people would tell us that Israeli soldiers took them, put them at windows, placed their rifles on the shoulder of the human shield and shot their neighbors. And that is absolutely a war crime. Um, and so, you know, there's many instances of things like that, and we want to bring that to the international community. Precisely. Um, Max Blumenthal, he's also saying, the film needs to be entered into the record of the International Criminal Court under the watch of Benjamin Netanyahu. Exactly. I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu has overseen massacre over massacre, and I mean, it's never been more clear than in the recent Great March of Return, when Israeli soldiers under his command have opened fire and shot um, as many as 14,000 Palestinians and killed about 160 of them. And I mean, there's overwhelming evidence for uh, war crimes um, for Benjamin Netanyahu and his command to be convicted of war crimes, I believe. And um, there's simply not the political will to do it because we are in the heart of the U.S. empire. And, you know, basically, when if a dictator or a, or a despot is our friend, then he's fully, you know, it's fine if they commit war. You were mentioning empire and also words from you guys to say Gaza is the ultimate contradiction of the Western Empire. Gaza is a human warehouse, an ethnic prison. Exactly. I mean, this is the logic of Zionism. In order to have an artificial demographic majority, the indigenous population has to be warehoused separately, and that's what Gaza serves as. It's an incredibly tiny area. How, how big it is? It's about, in miles, it's about 144 square miles. Okay. Um, so it's, so, you know, it's a fraction of the size of New York City, for instance. Um, and you have two million people living in there. High density. Ex the, uh, among the highest density uh, places in the world. And so the only reason that that exists is so, you know, if you go to a cafe in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, it's almost only Jews. And so that is the violence required. And of course, people are going to resist. When they're displaced and imprisoned like that, they're going to resist. And so the stakes get higher. Israeli violence becomes uh, greater, and Palestinian resistance, of course, increases too. And talking about infrastructure, you were mentioning that uh, electricity only two, three hours a day, water is mostly salty. Tell us about a little bit, what is the, the panorama? Well, the conditions are absolutely unlivable in the Gaza Strip. Uh, you have rolling blackouts, as you said, two to three hours of electricity per day. Um, you have, when you turn on the faucet, you get salt water. Um, because of the, of the sea next door. Exactly. The aquifers have been drained and uh, the water treatment plants have been destroyed, actually bombed by Israel. And so um, Israel sells water to Gaza, but not enough. Um, so it's this very intentional policy. And same with electricity. They could sell more if they wanted to or provide enough. And it's actually their legal uh, obligation under international law is the occupying power. But they simply don't. Um, and so these are just the basic everyday conditions of life, not to mention you have drones and F-16s and shooting at the border. If you're a fisherman, you go out to sea, Gaza, uh, you get shot. Gaza is under blockade and siege and has been for about a de more than a decade now. Um, and it's simply because uh, they are the wrong you know, type of population according to uh, Israel's national policy. And you say that there's no employment. No, the unemployment is absolutely horrific. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, I believe it's more than half the population is unemployed, and there's no future in Gaza. All of the young people who I got to know who are educated, they're all looking for, for ways out. And it's not because they don't love their homeland and want to stay and be with their families and have a future, but it's because Gaza has been suffocated under this blockade. And so any way you can get out, whether it's scholarship or marriage or any way you can, people seek to go to Europe to the United States, to Australia, to build a life there. But then they suffer knowing that they're so far away from their family and there's nothing they can really do. Um, and then when the bombing starts again, there's you know, nothing more painful than knowing that your family could die while you're sitting in the comforts of you know, any European city. You were mentioning also that there's an asymmetrical warfare. And now the 
the resources that the Israeli army are using, uh, we're talking about artillery, we're talking about drones, we're talking about F-16s. And if the people, the Palestinians in Gaza, tries to get closer to the fence, about 30 meters, 100 feet closer to the fence, automatically they are shot. Absolutely. It's actually more than that. It's, it's uh, 100 meters, and it's very, lo very loosely interpreted. The vast majority of this land, it's what Israel calls the buffer zone. It's the f so where Gaza is fenced off from Israel, 100 meters inside is considered an open fire area. So Israeli snipers will literally just sit there and shoot farmers or anyone who ventures in. I've been in these areas and it's absolutely terrifying. Um, you never know if you're, if you're gonna get shot. And this is the policy that was enacted by Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion in 1948, that anyone who attempted to return to their land uh, would be shot on sight and now that policy has just increased and become more violent and it's what we see playing out in these demonstrations. Also you mentioned that uh, snipers are killing children? Yes, this is, abs this is absolutely true. Um, we've seen a, several children killed just in the, last, uh, in the last several weeks in these Friday demonstrations. Um, I mean, it's long been known that Israel has uh, a policy of killing children and it's in line with what how uh, Israel considers Palestinian children to be a demographic threat because Israel's definition as a Jewish state is not about Jewish values or any of the humanitarian values that I was raised with as a Jew here in this country but simply as a demographic concept so we have to have in Israel there has to be more Jews than Palestinians and so a Palestinian child is a threat to that and that's basically grounds for shooting them. I'm sure that if you spend all that time in that region you got lasting uh, experience and vivid images. What is the learning lesson that you learned the most or that impressed you the most? Well, on the final night of uh, the 51-day war, I was stationed in a media tower with several Palestinian colleagues, and I was filming Israel, Israeli F-16s taking down, bombing, um, the largest towers in the Gaza Strip, you know, if in the American equivalent would be like the World Trade Center, the biggest towers, the symbols of the Gaza Strip, of, uh, of the wealth of, of Gaza. Um, and I saw Israeli F-16s bomb these and completely destroy 14-story towers, and it was absolutely terrifying for me. And then months later, I went to an Israeli military weapons conference and I'm listening to this Israeli general speak, and he had actually just retired. And he says, taking out those towers, it wasn't about any military value. It was a total attack on civilian infrastructure. That I knew. But what he said is that, um, that, that taking out, that Israel bombing those towers was just like Al-Qaeda attacking uh, the uh, World Trade Center on 9-11 here. And it was about sending a message. It's about psychological terror, and this is what the... Uh, Israeli army is doing. It's state terror um, just like, and uh, you know, it's incredible to hear an Israeli general favorably comparing the army, the Israeli army to Al-Qaeda. I mean, this should be a scandal in the United States, but I reported on it and nothing happened. In that case, what do you think about the media? What is the role of the U.S. media? Well, I think f from left to right in mainstream media in this country, um, it is essentially pro-Israel, and it is stuck in this narrative of, you know, is there a peace process? Why don't the Palestinians want peace? And it's just a canard. It's a total lie to the American public that there is parity, that there is, you know, two, two equal sides to this conflict, when really there's an occupier and an occupied. And it's a, it's a disservice to the American public who needs to know what their tax dollars are funding and actually it's you know it's blown back uh, it's you know the term we, we use is blowback when Amer the American public when America actually pays for it um, and it continues to be in the Middle East a cause of anti-American sentiment is the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian crisis with the US backing the occupier and backing apartheid. So when you're hearing that the press is fair and balanced uh, is it really? Absolutely not. It's, it's a complete joke. I mean, if you look at even the New York Times, which is supposed to be the paper of record, the liberal intelligentsia uh, of this country, you know, uh, one of the most famous incidents of the 2014 war on Gaza was when eight boys, there were boys, brothers and cousins, were playing soccer on the beach, and they were bombed by an Israeli missile. Four of them were killed, four survived. And the New York Times headline says, uh, you know, 
uh, boys playing soccer, you know, find their way into the middle of conflict, something like that, that completely obscured what happened. It was a brazen attack on children playing soccer on the beach, and, and, and you're just left with no idea what's happening. And that's representative of what happens across the board. Israel has defined uh, the civilian Palestinians as terrorists, non-dangerous neighbors, and that is letting them get away from the Geneva Convention. So it's, uh, it's what you witnessed. Absolutely. I mean, in 2014, you had 2,200 people killed, the vast majority of them civilians, 551 children. And the only way to justify that is to say, well, it was collateral damage, you know, it's, uh, it just, they just happen to be neighbors with the terrorist. Um, and so... Um, Ter terrorist is Hamas? Yeah, I mean, it's anyone... What they call it Hamas. Anyone who... Yes, exactly. Ha not only Hamas, anyone who takes up arms. But even now, you know, they'll say that... Um, They'll say that anyone flying a kite is a terrorist because of there there have uh, been um, burning kites that you know some Palestinians have sent over the fence and burned some some Israeli crops um, and so anyone who you know is flying a kite is a target. I mean the you the word the word terrorist in Israel is is thrown around so much that it's really kind of lost any sort of meaning um, and it's basically just used to mean Arab. So you mentioned also about the health the health situation and also you say that. There are people who are having cancer that need to get out, and they cannot. Absolutely. This is part of the siege, and uh, people cannot travel. The, the medical system in Gaza is completely uh, deteriorated, dilapidated. And this is not because lack of doctors. There are highly trained, excellent doctors there, um, and many of them, and many people who want to help. But the Israeli siege does not allow certain medical supplies um, for instance, you can't get, ke you can't get chemotherapy, and, and uh, if you have cancer, you can't get treated in Gaza. And so there are many people who die while they're waiting for permits to go to an Israeli hospital, to go to Egypt, to travel abroad, many of whom even have uh, citizenship of other countries. Because Israel controls every single step of everybody there. You have to go through all the paperwork, the red tape, in order to get in and out, and so on and so forth. Exactly. In, in order to enter Israel, you have to be on waiting lists for months and months and months. I met people who had American visas you know, to come to this country and they were all cleared by the U.S. Embassy and everything, and they purchased their flights, but they literally couldn't exit the Gaza Strip to go use their visa. And so then they would have to start the process all over again. The idea is to create so much psychological pressure on people that they just lose their mind. Are there Americans living in Gaza? Uh, there, are, there are a few Americans. I mean, there are Palestinian Americans, there are Palestinian Canadians. Um, yeah, they, they're around, but, you know, they're, they're subject to the same conditions. And, you know, there's a real irony there that their government, this, you know, here in the U.S., is backing their occupier. And so it's, you know, where is the, where is the government protection? How would you ac assess the cozy relations between the U.S. government and the government of Israel? Well, the government, I mean, for many years, um, the U.S. and Israel have had an extremely tight relationship for a number of reasons. Um, one, of course, is because of the Israel lobby, because of AIPAC, also because of Christian Zionism in this country, which is fundamentally anti-Semitic and, and envisions a holy war when all of the Jews return to Israel and then the Messiah comes and the Jews who don't accept him die. That's a major reason of support. Um, but what we really see coming out in the Trump administration is the abandonment of any pretense of fairness that for, for many uh, administrations, the U.S. has tried to pretend that it's, oh, we're committed to this peace process and we're going to you know, make it happen finally. And Trump and Jared Kushner um, are so close to Benjamin Netanyahu, partially because um, of their Trump's top funder, Sheldon Adelson, um, is a right-wing casino magnate billionaire from the U.S. Um, and he's also a major funder of Benjamin Netanyahu. And so we see, you know, that what's playing out is partially just Sheldon Adelson's vision for the country. And is it a way of corruption? Absolutely, but I mean, in this country, it's not considered corruption. Uh, there's so much, there's so much uh, talk about foreign meddling and all this stuff, but it's completely legalized. We call it lobbying in this country. It's just legalized corruption. And uh, what do you think about, for example, the relationship in the area, uh, U.S. with Saudi Arabia and the demonizing of Iran? 
But what's really incredible is to see this axis between Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the U.S. For many, many years, Saudi Arabia and Israel have become increasingly close. But it's bad for the public image for both countries. Because of the human rights, for example, abuses. Because, and for a long time, the Arab and Muslim cause has been against Israel. But now we see the Gulf uh, monarchies or theocratic monarchies, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, becoming increasingly close to Israel. And part of that is because it's a way to become close to the United, even closer to the United States, is to become close to Israel. And so we see Saudi Arabia in particular and Israel, their interests in attacking Iran uh, coming to light. Um, and even, you know, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince. Um, Saudi of Saudi Arabia, Arabia is basically completely rejected Palestinians and said, we're going to have peace without Palestinians. What could happen with the withdrawal of uh, Donald Trump's of the Iran nuclear deal and uh, that is going to take effect in a few months? Well, it certainly puts um, Iran and the U.S. on the pathway to war. Donald Trump essentially threw diplomacy out the window because this was the, you know, the greatest diplomatic achievement of the Obama administration was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or the Iran deal. Um, but Donald Trump essentially threw that out the window and the only path now is war. The question in my mind is does Europe does the, uh, the European Union have the will to resist the you know, leadership, if we can call it that, of the United States and say, no, we are going to stay in this deal with Iran. It's the United States who's acting as a pariah and violating the deal. And that's the way we can avoid war. And you think that eventually the U.S., because of that, could impose sanctions in Europe because not withdrawing from that? Iran deal? Well, the U.S. has talked about that. There were actually um, some of the foreign ministers of European countries, uh, including Boris Johnson, um, were the lobbying. The British. Yes, exactly. We're, we're lobbying the United States to um, exempt them, exempt businesses that do uh, business with Iran um, from the sanctions. But if the United States c sanctions the European Union, what I see it as, it's the decline of the American empire. The United States is completely isolating itself. And that's what we see, I think, all over the world. And that's what Trump is. Trump has lifted the face off of um, the American empire, lifted the mask. And we see the true ugly face of the American empire. And now with his kind of erratic behavior, he, the United States can't really be trusted. It's unpredictable. And you know all bets are off the table. And talking about erratic, what do you think about the the summit between uh, the U.S. and North Korea, Trump and Kim? Well, I mean, it's a huge, it's a st it's a step forward, I will say. Um, and you know, there's nothing uh, that would be better for the people of Korea, the people of Southeast Asia in general, and the American public than peace. Um, and that should be our ultimate goal. And I think it's not, this is not uh, a victory of Trump so much as it's a victory of South Korea because Trump and John Bolton and Mike Pence actually tried to um, sabotage uh, this, this Before, talk. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And so, you know, Trump has threatened to use nuclear weapons on the Korean peninsula. Um, and, and basically, once the U.S. said, well, we're not going to have that deal, South Koreans and the North Koreans said we're going to do it anyway and so the and so the US is marginalized and losing its influence and so what does it do oh, so, oh okay we're going to be part of this and so South Korea and North Korea are leading the way to peace what's really fascinating in this country is to see the liberal elite class the punditry attacking Trump from the right and saying how dare you say we're going to uh, suspend military drills without getting anything in return well what do we want more than peace and they're, I mean, they call Trump a fascist dictator and, and compare him to Hitler and all this stuff. And then they say he needs to be more militaristic. And it really exposes what the, you know, the so-called progressive liberal class is in this country. Finally, what are your plans? Uh, Killing Gaza Part Two, new films. What do you have in mind? Well, I'm working on a, a second film about the Israeli right. Um, and uh, that I will announce soon. And then there's, I'm also a co correspondent at RT America doing my daily work there and uh, you know we'll we'll see what the future holds but uh, you can see the movie at killinggaza.com Dan Cohen thanks very much for joining us thank you us.